While British Leyland is more often bemoaned for its many failures, with cars such as the Morris Marina and the like being derided for their archaic design, the company did in fact have strong aspirations when it came to the next step in engineering design, with Spen King, the man behind the formidable Range Rover, establishing a specialized division which would help to create some fascinating projects, including, among its slew of potential creations, the lightweight ECV3 prototype. British Leyland's drive for innovation during its early years were primarily handed down from those companies which had come to form the massive conglomerate upon their merger in 1968, with futuristic design elements including hydroelastic and later hydrogas suspension systems having been pioneered originally under the likes of British Motor Holdings during the mid-1960s, a concept which, while yielding solid principles, was dragged down due to the shambolic build quality of British Leyland products during what was known as the Dark Ages. Following its bankruptcy and subsequent partial nationalisation under the Callaghan government, November 1, 1977 would see South African-born business magnate Sir Michael Edwards take over the role as British Leyland's chairman, and immediately saw that the main problem with the company, aside from its terrible quality control, was a lack of forward-thinking designs which matched the standards of other contemporary models, perhaps the most notable example being the Princess range, which, despite being clearly styled to accommodate a hatchback, was fitted with a tiny boot that compromised its luggage space significantly, when compared to similarly sized and even smaller cars which sported a tailgate. The result was the Product Recovery Plan, which outlined a list of new cars needed to replace aging models such as the Morris Marina, the Austin Allegro, the Maxi, the Princess and many more, followed by the management and unions within the company, undergoing a rapid reform which resulted in the sacking of the notorious Derek Red Robbo Robinson, perhaps the biggest figure in British Leyland's trade union. In addition to these early moves to revitalize the firm, research and development departments, which comprised the many R&D divisions which had been inherited by the companies that were merged to form British Leyland, were brought together under the guise of BL Technology, and will be based at a brand new proving ground on the site of the former RAF Gaiden in Warwickshire, an airbase which had previously been the home of Vickers Valiance and Handley Page Victor nuclear bombers, with the BL Technology division being founded in 1979 and headed by the aforementioned Spen King. In May 1980, BL Technology announced to the press its many aspirations for the future of the company, which was presented at the brand new Gaiden facility in the form of the ECV2 or Energy Conservation Vehicle No. 2, the first brand new product of British Leyland since the Rover SD1 four years earlier, and was met with a positive reception by motoring journalists, with a great amount of emphasis being placed on the fact that British Leyland would finance the car entirely from within, while equivalent automotive research by French, German and American manufacturers was financially assisted by their respective governments, the ECV2 being essentially a running version of the earlier ECV1 non-powered test mule, which had been used to evaluate body stresses. As for the ECV2 itself, this was a running prototype based on the ADO88 Super Mini concept of 1974 and was constructed purely for research into aerodynamics and running gear. And while the use of an existing car as the basis of this machine meant that the design was compromised as an overall concept, it proved to be an important stepping stone for the future of Leyland's engineering direction, as well as proving to be a useful testbed for the company's brand new highly secret three-cylinder power unit. The ECV2 was able to attain a fuel consumption of 100 miles per gallon at 30 miles an hour and, more realistically, over 60 miles per gallon at 60 miles an hour and 55 miles per gallon on the combined ECE dynamometer cycle, sensational figures which, even by the turn of the new millennium, were phenomenal when compared to other high-efficiency models of the time, with Spen King insisting that all BL cars should be performing to these standards by the end of the 1980s. The running of BL Technology was a testament to the forward-thinking and initiative demonstrated by King and his team, declaring that in the future, petrol rather than diesel would be the fuel of choice for small cars, with models powered by highly efficient multi-valve engines running compression ratios, as well as lean burn technology being essential, and up to 5% of the cars in use being powered by LPG depending on taxation, while CVT transmissions were deemed to be the most efficient way of getting the power down, and therefore would be widely used with tests by BL Technology illustrating that a CVT-equipped Triumph Dolomite returned a fuel consumption of 56 miles per gallon at 30 miles an hour when compared to the 49 miles per gallon of its manual counterpart. 
At the same time, King fervently believed that cars would need to become significantly lighter, stating that a medium-sized family car should be up to 500 kilograms lighter than an equivalent model from 1980, and that steel and aluminium should be the choice materials for car structures, but married to an extensive use of plastics for non-stress-bearing areas, while aerodynamics should also be improved significantly by 1990, with drag coefficients that should be dropped to below 0.30 to affect genuine improvements. Noting that the performance of the ECV2 at 0.345 was less than satisfactory, together with its weight of 560 kilograms, King used these goals as the basis of what would become an improved model dubbed the ECV3, which he announced to the press after the launch of the ECV2 as a car that would be ultra aerodynamic and exceptionally light, while its three cylinder engine would be matched up to a Borg Vorner CVT transmission system. Two years later, in December 1982, BL Technology unveiled the ECV3, and, like its predecessor, it was made very clear that it would not be going into production, but would merely act as a mobile testbed for new ideas and engineering concepts, with the ECV3, regardless of its limited applications, proving to be a superb machine as it harked back to so many earlier British Leyland and BMC models from the past, being designed around the maxim of Sir Alakis Agonis, designer of the MIDI, that it should have the maximum amount of interior space for minimal external size, the resultant car having more legroom than an equivalent Ford Sierra, while being some two feet shorter. In terms of efficiency and performance, the car presented a drag coefficient of a mere 0.24 and weighed an incredibly light 664 kilograms, while at the same time exhibiting a 0 to 60 time of 11 seconds, a top speed of 115 miles an hour, and fuel consumption figures which range from 61 miles per gallon at 75 miles an hour, 81 miles per gallon at 56 miles an hour, and 133 miles per gallon at 30 miles an hour with the car's top speed and acceleration being easily comparable to other 2-litre family saloons of the time, while the car's incredible efficiency was owed entirely to its lightweight construction and aerodynamic shape. The ECV3 was powered by a 1.1-litre 3-cylinder single-can 4-valve per cylinder engine producing 70 horsepower and weighing only 84 kilograms, a creation somewhat similar to that of the modified power plant used in Spen King's earlier Triumph Dolomite Sprint, and would, through derivatives, go on to form the basis of the Kane series engine in 1989, which would power nearly every Rover product for the 1990s. While a highly advanced aesthetic design, the car's underpinnings were based on more traditional elements from British Leyland's history, namely taking a leaf from the book of the Rover P6, wherein the ECV3's body involved a load-bearing base frame to which unstressed panels were attached, the base frame being constructed of aluminium, while all the panels were plastic, contributing to the car's low overall weight with the body in white weighing a mere 138 kilograms, roughly half that of a contemporary steel monocoque, with this concept being revolutionary for its time, more so for its use of aluminium. In all, the ECV3 was an exceptionally efficient package and helped to point the way for more innovative designs when it came to British Leyland's future prospects, with the ultimately unsuccessful AR6 project being the car most influenced by the research conducted on the ECV3, which, despite a promising start as a potential replacement for the Metro, was axed for a variety of reasons in 1987 in favour of an updated generation of the Rover 200, although the bespoke power unit created for the ECV3, as mentioned, would form many aspects of the highly successful K series engine of 1989, which remained a highly competitive power plant well into the new millennium. As for the predictions made by King as to the future of small car motoring, his outlook on the replacement of diesel by petrol as the preferred choice of fuel type for these machines proved decidedly prescient, although his considerations as to getting cars as light as 500 kilograms were unfortunately never met by any major car manufacturer, primarily due to the onset of increased safety equipment such as airbags and cross members, which thereby improved passenger crash survivability, but at the expense of lightness, the focus turning away from weight shedding and instead upgrading efficiency through engine displacements and tunings, and body shells optimized through computer design to garner the lowest drag coefficient as possible so as to attain higher levels of refinement and performance. Nevertheless, while the ECV3 was not destined for full production, that role going to the AR6 which ultimately never made it to assembly, the car's incredible achievements in delivering a superb fuel efficiency and weight were ones that helped to illustrate that, in the face of its ruined image of maintaining the status quo, British Leyland did indeed have many innovations under its belt which held a strong merit and were based on sensible principles, and to a certain degree had predicted what the future would hold for mass motoring, especially in the realm of small family cars and super minis, a contrast to the many ambitious but ill-fated concepts that had come before.